Council to order with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. This is our first meeting in this location, our first meeting um, since we've been out of the, uh, the COVID um, uh, location at the Merritt Center. So it is good to be here, good to have an audience here, um, good to have a public meeting. So a uh, few procedural things here this evening. The, um, um, we will be operating with the uh, um, meeting software. The council has um, done a little training on that. However, we will have um, our voting, online voting does not work. Uh, this evening, it's not nothing local. It's the uh, there was a crash of the um, provider, um, so we will have voice votes this evening. Um, Kyle, our city clerk, anything else that we should add as far as procedures? Nothing more. No. There we uh, we have some agenda items that may have presenters this evening, and we'd ask that. Uh, when you're presenting, come up and use the the microphone. The microphone is sensitive, and it will. Um, Alex Peterson can adjust the volume, so so you'll be um, don't have to worry about that. You can just be comfortable presenting. With that, we'll proceed with the uh, agenda that, that we have before us. Are there any changes to the agenda? If not, we'll operate under that agenda. We'll. Moved then to agenda item number two. Agenda item number two would be to consider the approval of the minutes of the regular council meeting that was held on June 22nd. So the council does have the minutes of those that meeting. I'll make that motion to approve the minutes. I'll second. second. Motion by Jim, seconded by Don to approve the minutes as they have been presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. We'll move then to the consent agenda. We can bring the items on the consent agenda up on the, the screen so people can see that. Um, so the, the consent agenda that it includes considered liability coverage, waiver for the 2021-22 League of Minnesota Cities Insurance Trust, property casualty and liability insurance. Uh, also on the consent agenda, Legion Field, uh, Park River Stabilization Project, the authorization to advertise for bids, consider the approval of the amendment to the sponsorship agreement between the City of Marshall and Viking Coca-Cola, the wastewater treatment facilities. We have a, a payment application on number 24 to Magni Construction, as well as a payment invoice uh, to consider for Bolton and Mink, uh, calling for a public hearing on proposed property tax abatement at 504 Elizabeth Street, consider the approval of a temporary on sale li intoxicating liquor license for Marshall Area Chamber of Commerce, consider the approval of the on sale wine and on sale 3.2% licenses, and then finally consider the approval of the bills and the project payments. So is there any item on the consent agenda any member of the council wants removed for purposes of separate discussion? If not, is there a motion to approve the items so on the consent? Moved. Second. Motion by Craig, seconded by Steve to approve all of the items on the consent agenda. Discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Uh, one item on the um, agenda that I would like to change or adjust, and my apologies, I should have mentioned this earlier. Agenda item number 15, which is the 2025 MnDOT College Drive Improvement Project. Um, the calling for a public hearing. There's been a request to move that um, from agenda item number 15 to immediately after agenda item number 11. Is there any objection to that? Okay, so we'll we'll do that. So agenda item number 11 the, um, is uh, Broadmoor Valley Association um, presentation and request. And um, at this time, um, Whoever wants to start with a with that presentation, um, you can come up. Well, Hello, is that good? Okay. Um, <laughs> my name. Oh yeah, you can uh, hand them out. Uh, my daughter is gonna hand out some uh, booklets there for you guys. Um, so my name is Jesus Hernandez. Um, Thank you. Better known in the community as Chewy. 
Okay. Um, do you need one for? No, no. Okay. Those are for you guys. Okay. I've Thank seen you. a lot of that. Okay. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you. Thank you. So basically, you know, our, our, how this whole movement started was um, we, we were really concerned about our, our streets in the park, you know, being so bad and not being able to have a school bus service go into the park. And so I, I, like I said, my name is Jesus Hernandez and I live at 147 Lilac Drive in the park. Um, and I've lived there for the last 21 years. Uh, and I've seen that park uh, deteriorate, you know, through these years without any anyone doing uh, anything to to um, fix it, um, and I think I think part of it is you know they just don't want to stick money into it. But um, so so we decided to form an association to to have a voice and speak to the owner of the park about fixing the roads. Um, our main concern at that time was um, bringing school buses back into the park because our kids were forced to walk long distances, you know, from one end to the other, which is close to uh, three quarters of a mile or half a mile, something like that. In any weather, you know, any any kind of weather, inclement weather, and, and stand by a very busy intersection on Saratoga, which is the only stop that we have in the park. Um, so that, you know, uh, made us, um, get really concerned about the safety of those kids, um, the, the safety of, of young children standing out there. Um, and on top of that, you know, there's other issues, and, and I think Dev is going to speak about that later, but there's other issues that are also a, a big concern um, when it comes to safety. Um, we have talked before you about the snow removal and all that stuff, um, but uh, just to give you a, a quick, you know, um, introduction to what we're going to talk about, um, things haven't changed. They've gotten worse through this time that we've been speaking up. And in case you're wondering why for such an important issue, um, there's very small group of people from the park, um, people are afraid to come and, and speak. You know, they're, every, time, every time we raise our voice, our rent increases and there's retaliation on, on some of the most vulnerable people out there. So, um, you know, that's the reason why there's very little or a small group of people that thankfully they're not afraid um, of, of, you know, the retaliation and, and they're just tired of all the situation that is going on in the park. So um, one of the things that I wanted to mention here is um, some families in the park have figured out that um, Lean School provides door-to-door -door transportation for kids, and they have started to send their kids to Lean instead of Marshall because of that. You know, these parents, some of them can't drive their kids to the stop. Some of them have jobs that start earlier than um, the bus stop time. So they have decided that they had enough. They, they're going to send their kids to Lynn. I know at least 10, 10 of those kids in um, you know, the state of Minnesota um, funds $14,000 per year per student. And you know, like I said, we know about at least 10 of those kids in the park that are going to Lynn. So that's like 140000 that are going to a different school instead of staying in Marshall. So just just a, you know just a thought and, and and just so you guys have an idea of how the situation looks out there, um, I'm gonna invite Tom Hay from Southwest Coaches to kind of uh, speak a little bit about the the bus company situation with the park. Thank you very much. And before you uh, leave the podium, yes. are you gonna come back and um, kind of walk through the the handout? Do you want to? Uh, yes, we will at that? the end. Okay, yes. good. Uh, we have more uh, testimonials to yes. give you and then we'll come back. Okay, thank you. Yep. Tom? Good evening. I'm Tom High. I'm one of the uh, owners of Southwest Coaches and uh, have been involved for a lot of years, probably close to 40 some years in, 
And it, uh, and, and I can't remember exactly what year it was, but we were back in, in discussion with the, in dealing with the school and working with the school in regards to the condition of the roads. And we were at one time going in there to pick up students and the conditions of the road had be, deteriorated to the point where it was unsafe. Um, there are a lot of things in our business that we will we'll work with, but safety is something that's just a non-negotiable in our world. And it's gotten to the point where the potholes had gotten so bad. And not only the, just the potholes and the condition of the roads, it was also the way they're being maintained or lack of maintenance, I should say, where there is no sidewalks, there's nothing as far as the, be able to go in there and as far as uh, having students walk, the snow removal, you know, you get a winter that has a lot of snow and there's the roads are really narrow and there's just nothing to do to, to provide safety. So we, in working with the school, and it was uh, Bruce at the time, uh, Bruce Lamprecht, as us, we had uh, had contacted them, and their basic response was, we'll just kick everybody out. We'll just not allow anybody to come in there. It's private property, and that's what the decision they made. So they wouldn't let us, they basically said, um, you're not allowed to come on our private property. So a little quick history, of that, so that's what they did. They just basically asked everybody to leave, and that's what ended up happening. Um, our desire would be is it to be able to provide the service within there, but it's got to be in a safe environment type of thing, both as far as, uh, you know, really maintenance of the roads in a proper fashion, and they're not. I mean, if you've ever been out in there, the potholes are horrible, and, and they're getting worse. They they fill them in for a little bit, and then they come right back in, and, and, um, and then again in snow removal, it's hit or miss whether they get done or not, and so... Any questions? Tom, can I, yeah. just to, to clarify, and, and, you know, as you rightly said, that this is private property mm -hmm. and they have control of the streets. Mm -hmm. They won't allow your buses to come in, but they allow Lind to come well, in? Well, that, that's something that they really don't, you know, we've never received any other direction other than the fact is that they basically had, uh, um, when they had said, um, and, and I don't even know if they let garbage at the time. They removed garbage from there. They removed everybody from there. They thought the bigger vehicles were the ones that were damaging the roads. And, you know, the bigger vehicles haven't been in there in years, and the roads are still deteriorating. So, Any other questions for Tom? Thanks, Tom. Thank you. <coughs> yes, yes. Um, just to clarify, um, Lean doesn't run school buses. I should go to the mic, right? Um, just to clarify quick, uh, Lean doesn't run school buses in there. They run smaller bands, like uh, oh. um, cargo bands and those okay. types. Um, but yeah, that doesn't mean that those bands are not being um, damaged by those roads either. I don't know how they, they, they handle that. But um, we have a... A person that couldn't make it today, she wrote a statement um, um, that my daughter is going to stand and read up here. Uh, yes. Before you go on to that, uh, Tom had mentioned something about the uh, garbage removal. Yeah. Uh, is he letting garbage trucks in? As as far as or as of right now, yes. But there was a talk about um, kicking everyone out and just keeping one company in there, which I don't think that's legal, but, uh, and make us pay for it. But, um, but as far as of right now, um, there's, um, normal removal. It, yes. And that would be my question. Recycling is, is in there as a normal yep, regular, okay. regular. Um, I don't know how they worked out with him because garbage trucks are just as big as school buses, probably heavier, but right. yeah, I don't know. So, yeah. Oh, oh, welcome. What is your name? Uh, hi, my name is Genesis. Okay. Okay, so I'll just be reading this. So it says, hello, my name is Raquel. For a long time now, I've been living with a lot of worries along with my family about the conditions of, of many units in our community. These units have been abandoned for years, even for decades, exposing the elements with broken windows and doors, and most of them with broken skirting or none of, none of it at all, posing a constant uh, threat of 
animal infestation. One of those said units is one next to my house, only a few feet away from my house. On June 4th, my worst fears came true. When I was about to leave my house, I noticed the smell like burning, and I looked over and there was a smoke coming out of the abandoned unit. So I quickly ran inside to, and told my family that what was happening and to be ready in case we had to step out of the house. Then we called the fire department and I was very scared. Because of the fire, I was really close to it, was really close to a gas meter and lines. Fortunately, the, um, Fortunately, the fire department showed up just a few minutes after we had called and took control of the situation. It is frightening to think what if that would have happened at night or when no one was home. Only my two pets, I don't even know, I don't know what to think about it. I feel that this incident is a reminder that this abandoned, these abandoned homes are a big threat to everyone in our community, especially to our children or pets because they don't know they don't know any better. Thank you. Yep. Oh. <laughs> Deb from the association will be coming up to speak. <laughs> Good job. Nice. Good. And I've got some handouts for you guys. Take one of each, pass them down, please. My name is Deb Ertle. I live at 517 Locust Drive at Broadmoor Valley for the last 27 years with my husband. Uh, when we moved in in 94, I paid $155 for lot rent. And now we just got a letter here last week that says it's going to be $375. That's 142% raise in lot rent. Uh, and we also pay a dollar a month to have a pay our bill online, and if you have to go to Walmart to pay it, it's $4 extra. Um, for the last 20 years, the guy that owns it now has had it for like uh, since 2002, but the last 20 years, it's really gone steadily downhill. Road conditions and home conditions are all in the time low. The management and maintenance does what it can with a little amount that the owner t trickles back down into the park. But the, job, the roads just get worse and worse. And as of right now, there are 14 vacant, uninhabitable, plus six questionable homes in the park that no one can live in. They're a danger to the safety of the community. They often remain unlocked with broken windows, skirting, doors, and decks, and are a hazard to the children and the health of the community. I've seen raccoons, skunks, and possums. In the letter, it states that New requirements imposed on us have increased our expenses and that we have removed some obsolete homes. Let's correct that. There's been one home that they took out of there last year. Nothing before or after. Um, it costs approximately $500 to remove that home. If you take a look at the booklet with photos, there are at least 14 other remaining uninhabitable homes at Broadmoor. Why aren't these being removed? In our estimation, there are about 40 lots being rented by homeowners at Broadmoor. 40 times approximately $350 is lot in lot rent, not to mention the 20 times approximately $800 in home rentals per month. The math there is something like $30,000 a month. It is a low estimate. Where is the money going? Look toward the back of that booklet you received. You can see in those photos that the money certainly isn't going into street repairs. When you enter into a lease and pay a fee to a provider of services, there is an unspoken baseline understanding that there will be an actual service provided on their end. Shire Holtz and Associates is not holding up their end of the bargain. The owner isn't paying the property taxes owed on many of the homes that he holds titles for in the park. That is public record. If he isn't making any improvements to infrastructure, infrastructure or contributing to our community, then that makes him little more than a slumlord. But what about the city of Marshall? One of the papers that you received contains the ordinances detailing the obligation for the owners of private streets 
to maintain their conditions to city standards. And that's all we ever hear is that's private land. That is one of the documents that I submitted to you. These ordinances are already on our books. We plan to ask, we've been asking for help from the city since 2018 and the problem has been going on far longer. We have been told over and over again that nothing can be done because it is private property. There are ordinances dealing specifically with private streets. Please, it's time to help us out. We pay city taxes too. What is the city prepared to do? Get our roads paved and to get the dangerous vacant homes removed? And that's all I've got. Any questions? Thank you, Deb. Questions? Okay, so so basically what Deb described this, you know, uh, the situation that is going on. Um, you can see the pictures, they probably speak louder than voices. Um, there's a lot more, you know, to it. There's cars breaking, you know, on top of um, all the other issues people are now having, uh, for the last few years, having, having troubles, you know, fixing cars because um, they break all the time. Their suspensions are not are not made for those kinds of roads. They're not off-road vehicles. Um, so, so yeah, you, I can go on and on with more stuff. But is is there any questions about what the hand, you know what the the booklet shows? Well, um, there was also a illegal um, burn last week. I don't, Quentin, if you want to make any comments about that or. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. There was a, a legal burn last week that was called by a, a, a resident that is not even in the park. Uh, we did respond, and um, at first it was called in that it was a grass fire, but it wasn't that. We found this burn pit that was full of mattresses, and just name it, it was in there. We did extinguish it. However, the property owner will receive a bill from the City of Marshall for that, and if it keeps happening, we'll just keep doing doing just that. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, open up for uh, any questions, discussion, John? No, yeah, say, Quentin, before you sit down, um, the, uh, what was talked about, the house, uh, the it, home that was on fire on June 4th, was there any uh, cause of the blaze? Because of, uh, did you able to find out anything on that? Yeah, the and, state and, fire. And, and before you start, uh, for the audience and for those viewing, uh, Quinton Brunsville, Marshal Fire Chief. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, the state fire marshal, I did call the investigator. He did come down to investigate, and they did determine that to be an electrical fire. Um, he did note some other things about the property as well, uh, but everything came back to um, basically non-code compliant outlets that are on the outside of the property that most likely shorted out due to who knows why and caused the fire. So there was actually power into an abandoned building? There must have been, yeah. yeah. The breakers were not tripped off the pedestal, I should say that. So, okay. Well, they were after the fact. Yeah, yeah. So that's one thing that they did document in their investigation. Thank you. Anything else? Just, just curious, in the pamphlet that you gave us, was that 119 Spruce Lane where the fire was? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But other questions from, that the council may have? Just adding to the illegal burning, um, it's a constant activity out there. Um, and I'm assuming it, it's the one that they do behind the shelter. Um, they, they do it all the time. They burn illegal stuff out there that they're not supposed to be burning. Um, and and it's, it's a maintenance guys are forced by the owner to do that. Yes. I apologize. I don't know if it was you at the time that I talked to, but I, I basically told some residents that if you see it, see it, call 911. We'll come put it out. They'll get a bill, and they'll eventually stop burning out there. That's what I think will happen. I mean, I would if that was me get receiving the bill all the time. So if you see illegal burning, that's not that's against the city ordinance. 
It's actually against the fire code. Just call 911, we'll come put it out, and they'll get a bill. Gwen, we should, we should talk about some of that offline too, because we might be able to have a bigger reach back on that too. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, they, they do it at some hours that people are not aware of sometimes. Um, we just know because there's all kinds of um, debris out there and stuff. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, to add to to our overview of what you're looking at is um, uh, we understand this is private property, but it's also a business because he's making a profit out of it. Um, and, and, you know, he's, uh, these are low-income families, lower-income families that are uh, going through this. Um, these are... You know, about 80 families, if not more, they call Marshall home, and they're they're being treated that way. Um, you know, it's just it's just sad to even even think about if we don't do something about it. You know, what's going to be next? You know, I I don't even want to mention the safety part of the children out there because what if something happens? You know, and no one did anything to to change that to fix that. So, is there any questions about the, the, the booklet that I might have an answer for? Russ? Uh, I, in the letter that Debbie gave us, it said, new requirements imposed on us have increased our expenses. Has Mr. Shareholt said anything about what those requirements are other than taxes and labor costs? No. Okay. Okay. So Just that could be new <clears throat> requirements, so it could be taxes and labor. Could be. Okay. Or it could be not being able to have open burns. Right. You know, yeah. 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 That, yeah. that really fire. cuts into right. the budget. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I know we talked about this a couple of years ago when, when these issues came forward. And the license for the mobile home park is issued through the Minnesota Department of Health, correct? Yes. And is yes. that that's done by the joint power... But that's Local the public county. Health. We've been working with county right. public health on that. Okay, yes. yep. So that's part that they've got the delegated authority for the permits. What's their position on this? Uh, if I may, we, we've been in communication with Southwest Health and Human Services. Um, they've, they've tried to get some action as well through their annual inspections. As you mentioned, they do hold the, the permit right. over their head. So that we've been working with them. Uh, any concern that we get... We send letters that are, pertain to our ordinance. Mm -hmm. They handle things that pertain to their regulations, which usually applies to roads, drainage, the exterior stuff of the park. Right. Livability, external livability. Correct. And yep. we usually follow up on housing code type of items, like holes in windows or siding. Sure. Uh, we, we occasionally will send letters about the roads. Um, as was mentioned earlier, you usually get short-term action. A hole gets filled in, and then a hole reappears. Right. So. So just, and, and not to get off on a tangent, but a number of years ago uh, was involved with a similar situation in Laverne. And I think the problem, I believe that the, that the residents expressed this pretty, pretty well a couple of years ago when this came forward is that it's kind of the catch 22 or worse because what are your options? So when you lean on shareholders or the property is the owner association um, their their reply, I assume, or what I understand is, is well, we'll just shut it down. You just we'll just kick everybody out. And I, I mean, I don't know if that's their line now, but you know, um, it's you know, I look at these pictures, and I know in the discussion, I haven't been through the park, you know, for well, probably for a year and a half or longer, but but it's heartbreaking. I mean, it 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 it, I I. Totally understand why it's 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 not something that you want to want to deal with. I guess I'm looking at this, wondering what other pressures, what other avenues do we do, and then do you you know where's the break point on it? But I think that you know we need to continue to keep using the tools that we have as strong as we can, and then pursue the other discussions of other options that come in where maybe there is an option to to locate somewhere else. I mean, obviously the people that run this don't think it's a worthwhile business to really invest in and to grow. And I, I don't want to drill into their business model, but what you've just told me for rents, um, I mean, it's really pretty disappointing if that's the condition of the houses that he provides for that kind of money. I think that's a that's a pretty sad statement on 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 the property owner for how they manage a business. And I'd really like to 
see the city support these other options that are possibly on the platter. I mean, I, I know that's not the discussion here tonight, but um, you know, we've talked forever about our, our shortfall in town is housing and all the different levels of, of housing and availability and um, mobile home parks and, and, and the, the living that they provide, the opportunity that, be, that they provide are very unique and very necessary. And I, I think that, you know, as one council member out of here, and I know I'm not alone on this, I think it's, I think we need to keep pushing forward. And if we can't fix this one, let's, let's see if somebody else wants to put one in that we can work with. I'm, I'm tired of, I mean, I'm tired of him and the way that, that the group has taken and, and their response back is, is, you know, rather than try to progressively and productively work to a session or to a solution is to lawyer up and bully back. And I think it's time we just keep moving forward. I'm frustrated. I really am. I feel my heart goes out to you folks. I can't believe it. I think the council likely is in agreement with what you're saying, Craig, and that the, uh, Number one, we want to be sure we don't lose the housing option. But on the other hand, there's life safety issues, right. there's access issues. There's there's serious issues that that need to be addressed. And as Deb uh, mentioned, many of those are also addressed in our ordinance. And the issue is how can we uh, enforce the ordinance without having other consequences that um, would happen because of that enforcement. So. So, Sharon, as city administrator, I'm going to turn to you in terms of, you know, kind of future action and, you know, that the council could take, uh, but also working with the association, perhaps with um, some other resources. The, uh, the, the handout provided is, is helpful, even though we have a similar listing, but it builds, it builds additional evidence or um, our case against the the owner and and not that we have a a court case on file but we have had some discussions about legal remedies to this we did uh previously with snow removal put something in ordinance where we could if it was not met we can have an assessment method and correct me jason i don't believe we had that before so that was one remedy we did with that but it didn't correct all the other issues but this particular handout focuses in on if i understand correctly structures that are not habited they're unhabited yep. structures since 2018 and prior our biggest concern was displacing residents we just didn't want to have um, people on the street or not having a home and so we're reluctant in some of our remedies moving forward on enforcement because we didn't want shareholders, the owner, to uh, get to a situation where we're having residents not having a home. Um, so, you know, this this particular booklet will will help um, give us some focus, and I think it's easier. I'm not saying it's easy; it's a little bit easier than homes that are habited, and we. Um, and I know that Misty knows this, but uh, we, what we would like to do is have a closed session on July 27th to talk about litigation against the, against the owner. Um, can court action drive um, some corrections here? Could we have a method where the city is able to do the work and then assess it back? Um, those are some things that uh, we're looking at doing. We have sent many, many correspondences to the owner and I think um, someone mentioned that there is some correction. I think Tom mentioned that and others. And especially for Department of Health, I think they see some, some correction and uh, they, they then start the cycle all over again. Uh, however, it's just not a, um, a permanent solution. And so hopefully we can achieve that through some, some future legal action and that's kind of where we're at right now so i don't know if i missed anything jason or dennis but please feel a comment if you would like yeah. dennis you want to come anyway uh, <laughs> next door to the structure we are in there used to be a, a substandard hazardous building and the city of marshall started an action where the the council issues an order to the property owner you either tear it down or you repair it that led to subsequent litigation and the substandard hazardous building is no longer there. That option is available to the city regarding these uninhabitable 
hazardous structures right now. It, and those will be some of the discussions we do need to talk about. But the city can issue an order to the property owner. You know, get rid of your substandard buildings or repair them. If they don't abide by that, that is then evidence you can take to court to get a court order to have the city remove and bill those charges back. And that, that's, that's an option available that has been discussed and we will give that serious consideration next week. And not to get into the details, but previously, I'm gonna say within the last two months, there has been correspondence directing Mr. Shearholz to take action, correct, Jason? And there has been no action correct. by Mr. Shearholz. That is correct. Yes. Uh, I believe no response at all. No response. I just to uh, add in primarily for the public that uh, there has been somewhat of a, I would say, a carrot and stick approach with Mr. Shareholds on this. Uh, I know in the past uh, uh, the Attorney General has been down toward the uh, facility and uh, the park, and uh, I know some of us from the city have met with him after that. Uh, I don't know that there really was much that happened there that he could have done or whatever. Uh, I would also say that uh, uh, last year, uh, Lauren Deitz, the back EDA, and myself met with him to talk with him about grants and loan applications that were available for him through uh, Minnesota Housing. Uh, gave him the application, explained how to fill it out, went through the process. Uh, Lauren, on at least a couple of occasions, checked back with him, and uh, there was no action, no attempt to um, try to access any of the funds or loans. Some of those are still out there. Uh, it's Things are always changing a little bit, but there's actually dollars available for either uh, new owners, uh, organizations, or owners, uh, private owners of a park that can access funding at a uh, reduced discount. So this hasn't been just a stick approach. There's been, uh, say, a carrot and a stick approach where tried to assist with uh, funding, but there's been no, no action. And uh, Lauren, if I can ask you in the back, as of since then, hey, have you had any? Okay. Okay. So you went as far as you could with it and still nothing. So thank you. Yeah. Is there anything else? No. Yeah, I was gonna say, Deb, those numbers are 14 uninhabitable and six questionable. Yeah. Okay. There thank you. A couple of days <clears throat> One, uh, there was a fire in it like probably 15 years ago. They've done a little bit of work on the outside of it. <laughs> Nothing on the inside. And uh, just a couple of them like that. Uh, you know, he does a little something and then he backs off. He doesn't do anything again. Yeah. Um, some of the maintenance people that work for him there that say they, there's no funding for them to work. Um, he wants them to fix them, but they don't have the the money to do it. So they do what they can, and then they leave him half halfway there. And, uh, is there anything else? Chewy, I got a couple of questions. Yeah, and, yes. and with the maintenance people, I'm curious: are they are they residents, and then it's a in in kind compensation that they get, or are they contracts that don't live there that come in from outside? Um, who are they? That's a great question. Um, I'm not certain of the whole story, but there there has been people who worked uh, for him because they get their their housing uh, or a discount in their housing okay. um, expenses. Um, other people are not residents, but they've been hired to work for him, um, and then they quit. You know, most of them don't stay. Most okay. of them are people who are probably. Um, desperate to find a job sure. and, and they work for a few months or weeks or even days and they quit because um, the situation is not easy even for them. Right. They, we have had some uh, really good maintenance people out there, but they, they can't work when they have 
no money to run the the equipment, right. so they can't move. They can't, you know, uh, clear the snow or anything because there's no money. So, so the items that go back in the pile and for the illegal burns, where does where does that come from? Are those houses that he has? Is that him or them trying to clean up these abandoned houses and they're piecing it out there and burning it, or where does that come from? Yes, you're correct. There, all that stuff comes from those houses they're cleaning out to rent again. Okay. People that leave stuff in there, they take it out, you name it, um, mattresses, whatever, and they throw it on a pile um, behind the shelter, okay. and that's where they burn. And I, I'm assuming they do it at early morning or um, sometime mm-hmm. where people are not aware of sure. that. And again, I want to reinforce what what fire Sorry, chief. Trailers that they take stuff out of, they take things like cabinets so that they can piece them together in something else. <coughs> they only burn the stuff that they can't piece together. Sure. The non salvage salvage. Okay. Right. And and again what Chief Brunsvolt said about letting them know, please do that. That's a very, very important that if you see that let them let them know because it's important that they're able to respond and to document. It's as as much documenting it is as putting it out. So it's very important. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Chewy, can you comment or uh, talking before about uh, you know some of the repairs things? If you have a like say electrical problem, um, what what do you do? So um, for once, a lot of the a lot of the businesses in town won't work, won't go into the park to to do repairs for us. Um, even when it's inside our units that we own, they're they're afraid to go because they've been kicked out of the park for for billing the owner before. Um, so the last time I had to fix some electrical issues, they were not supposed to be paid by me because they were on the ground outside of the unit, um, and I needed to be fixed. I called. I called many, many businesses in town, and and finally I got a hold of someone that was willing to work. But he said, uh, um, I, "I I would have to pay because otherwise they wouldn't go." You know, so I I would have to pay out of pocket um, because if they bill him, they they don't get their money. So I said, "I'll I'll pay because I need the the power on in the house," but. That's just one of the many stories of people that are have gone through the same, the same issues with water, electric, uh, gas, you name it, uh, all kinds of stuff that breaks. They are not our responsibility because they're on the ground, and we have to pay him because he won't, he won't do anything. If we let him know, they it'll never get fixed. So we have to take it on our own. Any other questions? So. First off, um, thank you for um, making a, a very good presentation, a very convincing presentation. This is, as Sharon has said, this is very helpful. And um, the you know we have, as has been pointed out, there's public works issues in terms of the street and the infrastructure there. There's public safety issues in terms of fire. And while we didn't mention it, you know, probably other um, other um, safety issues that affect families in the park. There's legal issues in terms of uh, the level of enforcement that uh, is um, the city can do or should do in terms of enforcing the ordinance. There's, uh, there's permitting issues um, in terms of the permitting agency, Minnesota Department of Health, and, and delegated to um, Local public health, the um, and ultimately we want to see all those things really come together to really address this. And we also have kind of fair housing issues that we don't want to lose this housing option. So what I would ask, you know, under Sharon, under your direction, if you would kind of assemble the teams to address all of those areas. And as Sharon has mentioned, we would intend to meet in closed session, which we can do to. Uh, or need to do if there's potential litigation um, at our next regular council meeting, which is in two weeks. Okay. So that's probably 
where we'd be at this evening. So thank okay. you, Chewy. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. And for thank you, Deb. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. With that, uh, unless there's any other discussion from the council, I'll move us then to the next agenda item, um, which would be the intersection control evaluation report uh, prepared by Short Elliot, Elliot Hendrickson for the intersection at South Fourth and Country Club Drive. Bob, you're going to pull 15 up after. Oh, I was, yes, you're right. Thank you. So, agenda item number 15. We'll move, move to that agenda item, which is the 2025 MnDOT College Drive Improvement Project, the call for the public hearing. Jason. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so MnDOT is proceeding with plans to complete state project 4204-40, otherwise known to us as the College Drive Reconstruction Project for 2025, with the project limits from South 4th Street to Bruce Street. Uh, the project is a comprehensive reconstruction project that includes pavement, sidewalks, and all utilities. In accordance with state statutes, MnDOT is required to receive the city's approval of the proposed layout by resolution of the city council. Um, MnDOT has made significant efforts with this project to engage the, the council, the public, and key stakeholders along the route. Um, MnDOT project manager Jesse Vlamic is present here tonight and we can, uh, I think he's got a few things to say and also would like to present the layout. Um, tonight's action on the agenda is to authorize the staff to set a public hearing for August 24th to, uh, for a review of the, the layout and, and public comments, but uh, okay. turn it over to Jesse. Welcome Jesse, and again the action would be the call for the public hearing, so welcome. Uh, Mayor, City Council members, thank you for taking uh, some time out of your schedules and uh, thank you for also adjusting the agenda. Uh, my name is Jesse Valamic. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Department of Transportation to request city approval for the final layout of State Project 420440. Um, MnDOT is proceeding with plans to complete State Project 4204-40, uh, the reconstruction of Highway 19 from East Forest, or from 4th Street to Bruce Street. Um, in accordance with the Minnesota statutes, um, I'm submitting for submit, submitting for city approval um, the project's final layout identified as layout number 1A, State Project 420440. I also have an electronic copy that I will make available to um, the city for any further um, reproductions. Um, with that, um, we're looking for city approval. Um, it's required for this project because it alters accesses and it uh, requires permanent acquisition of right-of-way. Um, the municipal consent of MnDOT projects is described in the statutes that I've attached in the packet that I believe you all received. And the last time we talked, I believe you all had a very good understanding of the municipal consent process. Um, so with that, there's um, an approval or disapproval um, of the city layout, or the final layout is by re resolution of the city council, okay? So, however, I, I've also included a sample of the resolution. However, it is the city's, if the city neither approves or disapproves the final layout within 90 days of the public hearing, the layout will be approved, will de be deemed approved according to statute 161.164. And I have a, supplied all those statutes to you. Um, so the deadlines um, for the city, responsibility to regarding municipal consent of the attached layout are as follows and based on the submittal date of today, July 13th, 2021. So within 15 days of receiving the final layout, the city should schedule a, meet, a public hearing. Um, within 60 days of receiving the final layout, conduct the public hearing and also provide at least 30 day notice to the public for the public hearing. And within 90 days of the public hearing, approve or disapprove the layout by resolution. MnDOT will attend the public hearing to present the final layout and answer any questions as required by the 
statute. At this time, MnDOT has also planned um, several public engagement venues um, within the area. We are planning on attending music in the park, the farmer's market. Um, we have scheduled a uh, morning visit with the Chamber of Commerce and any businesses that want to attend. And we also are scheduled for National Night Out to present everything with the layout and how it uh, will proceed. We are also looking at a potential um, public open house to um, at the library to present the layout to the public and answer any and all questions that may be with the layout. So it, we also uh, will have um, additional display informations at both the city hall and the library for people that uh, do not want to visit the virtual open house that's online and also if they choose not to come to a event in person. Questions? So, and Jason, you might want to clarify this in the, just to clarify the procedure, we, they have turned over the layout to us, so we have received that. Um, in the memo, it talks about that that final layout would re be received July 28th. So, so we're moving this up a little bit. This is July 13th, and then the uh, public hearing on the would be then uh, the second meeting in August rather than on 9-11? Correct. Correct. So. Correct. The, the public hearing would be at the second meeting in August, and that'll keep us on the proper timeline and path forward. Okay. Questions any of the council has? So just it, the second meeting in August, just, I mean, the August 24th is what we're talking about, or did that move up? Correct. So the action tonight that we're presenting for the council is to authorize us to set a public hearing to occur at the August 24th council meeting. Okay. All right. That still meets all the timelines then. And then it would yep. be at, at that meeting where council would choose to, um, by resolution, accept the layout and provide the municipal consent that MnDOT is requesting. Although it doesn't have to be done. It doesn't have to be done no. that night. No. It has to be no. done within 90 days of that night. Of the hearing. So mm -hmm. rather right. than 1210, yeah. as it says, it would actually be a couple of weeks before that. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Those are uh, <coughs> last dates. Right. Those, right. The dates that I have in the letter are all based on just today's date. Okay. Okay. So, Greg? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, question kind of down the path, you know, assuming everything's going to move forward and we're going to do the hearing and do the approvals. I know that in some previous project work, like with the J-turns, there were some virtual training and some learning things that MnDOT did to kind of get the public used to what the new traffic patterns were going to be. And in our most recent PINT meeting, we talked about some improvements that we're proposing down Southview, just past your project here where the, where the crow's foot is. And we have interest also in doing some training. And my, my proposal in this is, is that we hopefully partner in that and do some timing so that we can coordinate that training and take advantage of some of what you set up and get the two birds with one stone. So, Absolutely. Um, um, I, I think I briefly mentioned the Jason. I don't remember um, exactly, but, um, and I've also been talking with um, some of our own uh, in-house people about doing something with uh, how to drive a roundabout. Yep. I know we, we do currently already have a video out there that we've used for other um, things, but this may be more unique as we maybe put something else together. I've even seen it in some community uh, recreational parks where they actually make the bike path for the children and the walking paths mm -hmm. in their little mini village, and they have roundabouts and J-turns. Yep. yep. The, the, actually, the Mankato... Um, district did one in St. James, yeah, where they actually had the roundabouts and they did some practice runs in like little cars yep. or like uh, um, golf carts, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have a, um, a pretty high caliber uh, communication specialist who would be able to work with your folks on that too. <laughs> right. <so>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with tons of spare time. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Okay, so, any uh, other comments? If not, is there a motion to uh, uh, schedule the public hearing? So moved. Second. Motion by Craig, seconded by Jim. Discussion? 
If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Perfect. One, one last little tidbit for the mayor and the city council. No, I do have a um, inspection person that will be out inspecting some of the buildings, um, especially the buildings adjacent to uh, the construction project. And he'll be out here either August 24th or August 27th. So just for your information. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. With that, we'll move then to back to agenda item number 12, the intersection control evaluation. Um, this is uh, the report that was prepared by SEH at the 4th Street Country Club Drive intersection. Jason. Thank you, Mayor. Um, at the February 23rd City Council meeting, the city selected engineering firm SEH to perform an intersection control evaluation for the intersection of South 4th Street and Country Club Drive. The traffic signal located at this intersection is aging and is not in compliance with current standards. The intent of the intersection control evaluation or ICE evaluation is to conduct a thorough analysis of the intersection to determine the best type of control for that intersection. The analysis included detailed traffic counts, review of ge intersection geometry, crash history, right of way review, utility review, a delay study, future trip generation, pedestrian analysis, and much more. It's a very uh, involved report and evaluation. So SEH was also asked to place due consideration on safe pedestrian crossing, minimizing driveway impacts, and minimizing property acquisition. Improvements that were considered here were traffic signal, all-way stop, roundabout, minor street stop control, and access reduction. So the recommended improvement that came from the evaluation is a split T intersection design that I believe is shown on the screen now, or at least one form of it. Um, the actual recommended recommendation from the report included a mini roundabout at the western intersection and a three-quarter access at the eastern intersection. The recommended intersection control meets the desired intent of improving safety for all users. It also um, improves operational efficiency and maintains driveway access while limiting property acquisition. Uh, this type of split T improves the safety by significantly reducing the number of intersection conflict points and reduces speed with the mini roundabout while also providing the lowest overall vehicle delay at the intersection. We did bring this to the PIT committee on July 6th and their recommendation was to um, move forward and recommend to council drawing, drawing number three and drawing number five which are included in the packet. Uh, both submitted drawings are split T type of improvements where 4th Street, in, instead of going straight through, turns into Country Club Drive at a perpendicular angle. Um, one design includes the mini roundabout at the western intersection, as sh shown there. The other intersection is uh, two three-quarter intersections with medians. So. Um, the, the reason why staff proposed drawing number five, which is the drawing with the mini roundabout, is you'll notice that there's full access provided to the adjacent property owners. Um, they all have the ability to enter the roundabout and turn and go the other direction. If you put a three-quarter intersection at that western intersection, anybody wishing to make a, a left turn out of the condos, for example, would have to go all the way down to Southview and country club and make a loop and come back. And that's quite a, quite a distance. So um, staff uh, really liked the, that, that drawing right there with the mini roundabout on the Western side. We, we really think it serves a lot of, uh, it, it satisfies all goals, I guess. But these are just concepts. And what the, what staff's really looking for today is that the council agree with the ICE report recommendation of a split T design and uh, authorize staff to try to find a place on the CIP in the next couple of years to put this improvement and work towards making it a reality. Um, I probably should turn it over to PIT committee members or any questions. Okay, thank you, Jason. Uh, any uh, input from the Public Improvement and Transportation Committee? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, it's um, one of the conversations we had is that we would probably want to try to do this. I think the project that MnDOT just proposed on on uh, College Drive is for 25. 
Correct. And so we're looking at 24 or 26, but not to do it in the same year. Hopefully we could find a place for it in 24, but um, that's that's kind of the main point. And I'll let, I'll let council members Labatt and Lozinski speak for their own thoughts, because we had a lot of good discussion on this at the meeting. Jim or Russ? Um, we're kind of undecided. That's why there's there's two of them because we think the public should have a little input of the with the condos there on what their thought is since it's going to directly affect them. I do know Marshall doesn't like change, and we don't have a roundabout yet, so I know that is going to be a discussion. But roundabouts are throughout. I mean, once you get used to them, they are very awesome. handy. Yeah. Um, but it's something that I don't know if we want to be the first ones ahead of the state or let the state do theirs first, but. It'll be a change to Marshall. It'll be a good change, but it's, change is tough. And I would echo what Councilman Lazinski and Councilman Schaefer said. I think the reason why we probably brought two plans forward was to give the community a choice, plain and simple. Mm -hmm. There's benefits both ways. I mean, and we as a committee saw those benefits, and I think the city realized those benefits as well. I mean, it's. Um, I think the roundabout uh, I don't know what the term was, Jason, because we talked about semis and buses and stuff driving. It's actually a roundabout that you could act, kind of drive over. I don't know what that it's is. Like a, it's like a modified speed bump. I mean, yeah, it's, there, it's okay, literally yeah. it's a drive through roundabout. So just in case you have school buses, that would be a question yep. questioning this project or, or semi trucks. You know, technically you could go up and drive yep. over the, those roundabouts. But I have nothing else to add other than that. So. So the. Um the action then would be to direct staff to um, to proceed with um, this project in the comprehensive um, improvement plan, capital improvement plan, CIP. The uh, there would be time between now and when it would be constructed to further get public input, community input to really evaluate on either of those two options. Correct. Correct, and I should probably add that both of these routes, and I, I stated in the memo, but we'll just reinforce that both routes are municipal state aid routes. We do have a funding source for these reconstruction projects. We are advanced, which means we uh, have a, a negative balance right now with them, essentially, with, with state aid. But we will continue to work with our District 8 state aid reps to ensure that we can fund this project in the necessary timelines. Uh, we did keep Country Club from fourth to second and fourth street from country club to college drive out of our current mill and overlay project with the intent that it could likely be reconstructed with this improvement at a later date so that's something to also keep an eye on as a council that the condition of those roads may drive the the timeline of this project to an extent as well um, but we feel confident that we could get this put into the cip prior to mindot's project if it was the desire of the council um, but, and uh, the, another reason to prefer the roundabout option, a great point by Councilman Labatt that they are a rollover center island and trucks will be able to make movements through there. We've actually also got it sized that school buses can go through the and make all movements without traversing over the center. So it's large enough that a fairly big vehicle can move through it and uh, semi trucks can just drive straight through it if they have to. Um, and the, the, the roundabout does a nice job of slowing traffic down coming up Country Club Drive as it's 40 miles per hour transitioning to 30. We like that feature to force people to slow down and interact with the pedestrians. So that's a that's a good thing in our mind. So Jason, are you looking for a um, the recommendation to include one option or either option? I will leave that to the council. I put in the memo that an alternative variation is to just recommend drawing number five, but the recommendation from PIT was uh, one of the two. And and I'm open to either from the council. And we'll just, either way, the cost will be close enough that as we put it in the CIP, we can work out the details sure. as we move along. Okay. Steve? So the, the question I have, Jason, I, I like, I'm with... Councilmember Lazinski, I like the idea of roundabouts, but with this mini one, the only thing I think of is snow removal. And is that roundabout, is that little hump going to take a beating with plows? You know, it may. Uh, this wouldn't be the first mini roundabout in the state by any means. You know, one that comes to mind in Hutchinson, for example, that's been there for a little while that we, we like to look at as an example. Um, 
Yes, to an extent, I suppose it could, but you know, we're going to take care to design this the best that we can and educate our maintenance personnel to, to try to take care of it and do what we can do there. So you're correct, and, and we won't know until we get into it, but yeah, I think that there, there may be some impact. Right, cause you hate to have it there. The costs are equivalent or close, but then the maintenance cost, because the roundabout, even though it might be a better idea, takes a beating with the plows and the roundabout may be easier to clean than those right in three quarter intersections with all the medians and turn lanes. Those, those get to be a bear median also okay yeah. yep i mean just as long as people i'm not the expert on it but i just want people to think about the sure. consequences Good going point. down and yep. done. if you ever get to detroit like they're they've just put in too many roundabouts on their main street which would be washington avenue down near the lake and they're you, you know, even even in a pickup truck, you halfway and drive over the edge, you know. Uh, but it doesn't force you to slow down maybe five, seven, eight mile an hour. And uh, it, they're, they're fine. I mean, they've been around long enough for most people to run into one from time to time. And they're okay. They're just fine. You know, there may be opportunity down the road to add a push button RRFB type pedestrian crosser here too once we see how the ones work next year that we get installed. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's opportunity to make this even better for pedestrians. That's why we like it. It gives us options. This roundabout option also has a wider median in the center, which makes it more comfortable space for pedestrians to seek refuge. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Good. John? Uh, Jason, uh, you've got the estimated cost at about 1.4 or 5 uh, million. Is that for either of the two choices that they're that close in pricing? Or is there a price advantage on one versus the other, and kind of how does that line up in comparison to the, all the other options? Yeah, they're, they're very close, and we've got numbers included in the report. Um, they're very close. There's a lot of median work on the other proposal. They'll come out close. So they're all pretty much in the same area? Very much the same. Okay. Okay. Mr. Mayor, and Russ. Uh, just for the information for the rest of the council members and also the public that might be viewing this, the committee did take into consideration border states, which would be moving out of that location in the near future, and also the possible development of county fair and what's going to happen with the west side location as well. With with all, all of those unknowns, because we talked about possible, maybe it's commercial, maybe it's residential, but we know that those three two out of the three will be vacated real shortly, you know, and the other one when the other one is vacated now. So, yeah, so just for the information for the rest of the council and the public. Any other input from the council? If not, is there a motion to accept the, uh, the report and uh, direct staff to um, include this project in the uh, upcoming CIP? I will make that motion. I'll second. Motion by Jim, second by John. Discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Agenda item number 13, the Convention and Visitors Bureau and the City of Marshall lease agreement for the Red Baron space, or space in the Red Baron <laughs> arena and office area. Sharon? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, CVB and the city have had informal discussions about office space in the last 12 months or so. And um, it began with exploration of more than just looking at city options, but what else is available in the community. There was a desire by CVB to explore other space um, due to proximity to some of their events. Red Baron happens to be one of those venues where they do happen to manage, schedule, um, help coordinate the events. And due to the proximity from the chamber office to Red Baron, there was a desire by CVB to, um, to really focus in on, on Red Baron office space. And I will um, have Cassie Weiss, the CVB director, talk a little bit about their board discussion, their recent action, and uh, where we are right now with a with the agreement that is in your packet. Okay, welcome, Cassie. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. 
Um, so we've been, like Sharon said, we've been talking about this for quite some time. Um, we've looked at some other options, but we at the CVB just feel like it'll be the most beneficial if we can be officed out at the arena. Um, right now, some of the issues we're facing is we're spending a lot of time driving back and forth to the rink um, three to four times a day, you know, packing up all the stuff that you need, getting out there, doing your work, meeting with people, and then driving all the way back. And it, it's just been a little bit of a waste of time that we're spending in the car. Um, the other thing that we would like to kind of start doing is just we really want to improve our client relationships with people who are renting out the facility. And if we're able to be on site for every meeting and every event, big or small, it's really going to help that client relationship. Um, we do have some people that just walk right into the arena right now and are looking for information, and nobody is there right now to grab them and be able to give them the correct information, let them know who to talk to. Um, so we feel like us being out there and being in that front office with Cody will just uh, be able to help with that as well. Okay, thank you, Cassie. Yep. Russ, any input from the CBB board as your our liaison there? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and I agree with everything Cassie said. I mean, the CVB board has talked about this for a good number of months, and we've talked about the pros and cons, um, and, and I'm going to be honest with Cassie, and, the, and really I think it was brought up, I believe, at our last meeting. The, uh, the board was concerned about how the community would react with Cassie's association with the, with the girls' hockey, and she's moving out there because she's going to be closer to the hockey then. So we have to, you know, that, that's a carrot that we have to talk about, or we at least think about, and, and I think Cassie's aware of that. The other thing I think the board was really concerned with was the, the t technically the office space. There, I know Cody's in that space right now, and, and I think the impression I think that I received, I could be wrong, was to move him to the back, but maybe not, maybe keep him there for the time being. So there's going to be three people in an office that, for the past year, there were times with the ice dogs and, and I think community services was out there. So it did work. It just causes times that confidentiality and things like that. On a positive side, like Cassie said, there's going to be somebody there to open up the doors at 8 o'clock in the morning. So if somebody does walk in at 8.15 for a meeting upstairs or for a meeting someplace else, you know, somebody's there. Um, I have, I still have mixed feelings about it. I think it's a good move. We talked about maybe building a portable office out in the lobby area. Um, I even, I know Sharon and we've got some extra panels from the, from the remodeling of City Hall here. You know, that maybe we could put those panels in the lobby area and make a temporary office. Um, you know, is that a band-aid approach? Yes, it is. But, you know, in the long run, I think if we're going to continue to host CVB out there, I think we need to need to take a serious look at office space, and that would mean an addition onto the building, plain and simple. I think that any of us would go out there and put three people in that office space and try and conduct a phone conversation or a one-on-one -on -one meeting, it's going to make it a little bit uncomfortable for the other two people that could be potentially there. Um, and so I don't know if Cassie, if you want to add anything yeah, to that, yeah. but I think the board was concerned with those those yeah. issues. I think the first thing is that we don't want to displace Cody at all. Um, that's not our intent here. Um, with his schedule and the way um, his job is is he really isn't in the office a whole lot and that's why we feel like it'll be able to work um, he's a facility supervisor so he's in the back he's zambonying the ice he's mowing fields he's doing a little bit of everything he is in the office but we don't feel like it'll be an issue um, and we kind of have talked with cody too that if this does happen and i get a phone call we're going to step out into the hallway or into the conference room that's right on that main floor so that we aren't having those interruptions and then I do want to just add one thing, too. Um, we are working with the Lyon County Museum right now at creating a visitor center. Um, so just a place that will work with Explore Minnesota, and they'll promote it as a visitor center as well, um, that we can have all our visitor information there from the state to visiting Marshall to having an event at the Red, Red Baron, the library. Everyone can kind of have all their spot stuff in one spot. Um, and then we'll help them promote their ice Schwann's ice cream stand as well. Very good. And Mr. Mayor, I think there was also, I believe, yourself and Administrator Hanson are aware that they did look at some space on East College Drive as well. You know, the, weighing the pros and cons, again, uh, they would still have to pick up and drive. The, the driving would be a little bit shorter, but they still would have to. And there was talk of turning that into a 
tourist center of some sort of that right. building. So, I mean, I think they explored all the options that, that could be explored at this time. So, Yeah, I think this recommendation that you're making was really driven by, you know, how can we be uh, most public facing to be have the most interaction with the customers. So yeah, absolutely. Other any other questions or input? I, I have a quick question because yeah. the visitors bureau should represent all of Marshall, and I guess my concern would be is, are they going to start representing just the hockey arena too much? Absolutely not. I think one thing to keep in mind is that we are contracted to facilitate the yep. arena, right. so we do need to market it. Um, but we just started our tourism grant, and we have donated to 13 sports associations, events, um, visitor, um, tourist attractions that are not related to hockey at all. I just know years past, and it's been eight, ten years, the Visitors Bureau used to, there was heads on beds, and that's all they did. Yeah. So that's a concern of, I, I know when we used to own a small business downtown, and, you know, that was the Visitors Bureau, the thing, they didn't do anything. Yeah. So, and like I said, that was years ago when they shared the office at the chamber. But that would be a concern to small businesses that were just yeah, I think relying we've, on the mayor. we've been working really hard to try to mend those relationships with other mm -hmm. sporting associations, especially, but also other businesses mm -hmm. to make sure that that isn't the perception or the truth at all. Perfect. But thank, thank you. you for bringing that up. Any other input? If not, is there a motion to approve? I move we approve. Motion by Craig. Is there a second? Second. Oh, second. Seconded by John. Discussion? I have a few comment, uh, corrections or cleanup of the lease agreement, if, if I could yep. review it before I submit it for signature, if it is yeah, approved. I was going to add that the city attorney does need to review the agreement prior to signature. Yeah. Very good. Any other discussion on the motion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Can I just add one thing? I did want to let the council know that um, Darren Rahm did get out yesterday. Um, so he is on an intensive supervised um, release. And Lauren is assisting me looking up what exactly that means and where he is located and making sure that we're still continuing to get our restitution money. But, so has so. he been making payments? He has about $20 a month. Okay. Well, I suppose prison doesn't pay that good. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. They're under minimum wage, Craig. Yeah. <laughs> Captive audience. So agenda item number 14, no, the uh, yeah. comprehensive plan task force. Uh, Lauren, do you have this? So uh, Lauren Deitz, uh, um, who has been directing the public effort in, in the comprehensive plan task force, you have a recommendation of task force members. Thank you. Yeah, I am here representing staff. Uh, following our selection of SRF Consulting Group, we were asked to develop a community task force. Uh, with that, we were given some guidelines of who should represent uh, the community as a whole. So we were given uh, a couple different categories of groups and sectors we should reach out to. And myself, Jason, and Elia, with advisement from Mayor Burns and City Administrator Hansen have come up with our uh, proposed task force. We currently have 12 members on our task force, all of which live within the community and work within the community. We thought that was a big key to this uh, process. With that, the task force can have up to 16 members. So if council feels that we are missing certain sectors or if there's other individuals we would like represented, we are able to add additional members. But you all should have the list in front of you. I don't think I need to walk through step by step unless there's any specific questions on our selection. But with that, we would bring these nominations forward uh, to have them included in our task force. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Questions? Now, is there a motion to approve the task force recommendations for a comprehensive plan? I'll make a motion to approve. Motion by John. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Russ. Discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Jason, I'm sorry, did you have something you wanted to add? Okay. Thank you, Lauren. Agenda item number 16, um, authorize city staff to receive quotes um, for the curb and gutter replacement. Jason. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so in 2021, this construction season, the council authorized $625,000 to be used for the annual mill and overlay project on our local roads. As part of the project, we'd like to replace some sections of curb and gutter 
to ensure proper drainage on our newly overlaid streets. Um, I've listed in the packet the streets that were overlaid this year. We won't go over that tonight, but um, of the $625,000, we've spent $590,260, um, largely due to competitive bids, so we didn't have as many streets uh, allocated for the treatment. Um, with the remaining $34,740 of funds, we'd like to better prepare for next year's mill and overlay project and use those funds on curb and gutter replacement on streets that we think will be overlaid in the near future, next year or the following. So we've listed a handful of streets that could receive the treatment, but what we'd really like the council to do is to authorize us to spend the remaining funds in this manner and allow us to go out and seek quotes from our local concrete contractors to see who can complete the work before the end of the year. So with that, I'll open it up for any questions. Okay, thank you, Jason. And there's uh, certainly been a substantial amount of curb and gutter improvements, the uh, the ramps to the sidewalks, the ADA compliance. There's been a lot of work that has been um, completed or nearly completed this summer. So and your intention would be this would be a continuation of that work, but you'd open it up for um, some competitive quotes from either the contractor has been working on it or perhaps some other local contractors. That is correct. We'd like to give the option to the contractor who has the project and then the other local contractors to see where we can get the best price. Questions? Jason, I would assume that none of the proposed roads are, are scheduled for any water or sewer replacement in the near future? That is correct. Okay. And Jason, these improvements are going to improve the road if we don't overlay them or not. I mean, the ADA compliant improvements improve the sidewalk either way if they get overlaid, correct? Well, with this, with this, this with these funds, we just want to do curb and gutter where we have sunken panels that retain water. These, these, these would not be for sidewalk ramp improvements. But it would still, drainage on those roads would still improve if, even if we don't overlay them. That is correct. It will improve the livability of the road. I see where you're going with that. That is correct. It's a good, it's a good treatment to do regardless. Yes, thank you. Any other input or questions? If not, the request is to utilize the remaining amount of the previously authorized budget um, for the additional curb and gutter improvement work. Is there a motion? I'll make that motion. I'll Mo second it. Motion by Jim, seconded by Craig. Discussion? Mr. Winger. Yes. Is there any other pressing projects that would be more beneficial to use this $34,000 that we have that might take precedence of it? It's a good question, but no, we feel this is a, a priority for us. We're trying to focus more on some of these curb and gutter replacements on our mill and overlay project and, and really try to make sure that we're, we're leaving a, a good product there because we do expect it to last 15 to 20 years at least and the curb potentially beyond that. So we, we want to make sure that we, we do it right. And we think this is a really good use of the funds. Thank you. You know, and some of the curb and gutter work was actually done by our own staff too, right? So. That is correct. And, you know, this year, with this year's project, we did a lot of scrambling around to get out in front of the contractor. We're trying to be a little better prepared for next year to make sure we don't have to work quite so hard. <laughs> Russ. Mr. Mayor, just one other question. You know, sometimes I have a problem that just because we didn't spend the money, do we really need to spend it? You know, um, put the money in the bank and spend it next year or whatever, like Councilman Meister said. So. I have mixed feelings about this. We've got $35,000 sitting there that we haven't spent, so do we have a gun to our head saying we've got to spend it to fix these, curb, these, you know, these curbs? So I, I'm, I'm mixed on it, so just bring that up, that's all. I think that's a fair concern, uh, but we would just note that our funding has been uh, frozen at the same amount for a couple years in a row, so we, we'd like to just say it's, it's a really good idea to c keep putting the dollars at the road system because you as a council will have a hard time funding it to a level that's high enough. It's just that hard with the cost of infrastructure. So we think that we like to take every dollar that you can give us and really put it to work for you. So that our, our idea is that it's not a wasted dollar, it's it's a well spent one. And, and depending on the, on the bid, excuse me, I, we might do five of these curbs and we might do all of them, correct? Yeah, we will not get all of them done. Uh, we're thinking that maybe half. Are they listed in priority order, like the worst? 
Yeah, we good. will. We will probably focus on an area, and then with next year's mill and overlay contract, put the remaining okay. on that contract. It, Russ, I, I have the same thoughts you do, and I've thought of that. Save the money, but then I've traveled to the communities that have not kept up with their infrastructure, and some of those communities, their cost is so much greater. And, and I know I bring up Duluth all the time, and that's a community that did not keep up with the infrastructure, and they're going to pay dearly for it. And, and some of the other communities we've worked in, the St. Cloud area, it's, it's, it'd be great to bank the money, but it costs a lot more sometimes to let our infrastructure fail. And Marshall has extremely good roads and infrastructure compared to a lot of other communities in Minnesota. And I give credit to previous councils and to our staff for making sure that we have good roads. So I do think it's money well spent on our infrastructure, but I agree with you. I, I, I weigh that thought back and forth too, but traveling on bad roads is not enjoyable. I mean, Broadmoor Valley is a good example. That owner has not kept up his infrastructure and I'm sure they'd love to take 35,000 right now on their roads. Yep. Yep. That's, a, that's, a great, that's a great point. And I'll just mention that we have over 80 miles of locally controlled routes that we have to maintain. And at the high, high cost to, to keep up, it's, it's prudent to keep chipping away at it and we're grateful that we have and uh, funny that you mentioned that councilman i was just speaking with a consultant the other day over the phone and and i was i was saying the same thing that we're grateful and blessed that we've had a council that's invested in our system over the last couple decades so. any other discussion on the motion i just like how we keep putting deb in the dark yeah, Deb, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking I need to sit under the uh, sensor. <laughs> Just start waving. Move, move. move. Yeah. <laughs> we'll give you a baton and a swash that you can there, there. there it is. <laughs> okay, any other discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion passes. You have the vote, Kyle? Okay. Agenda item number 17 is the uh, Bituminous chip ceiling, various city, various city streets. We have a change order and the, the final change order, as well as the acknowledgement of the final pay application. Any questions on this? Move to approve. Second. second. Motion by Don, seconded by Russ. Discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Agenda item number 18, another change order final change order and the final pay request and this like the last one uh, it's a it's a reduction so it's a of is i'll make that motion i'll second that motion <laughs> by Imagine jim that. seconded by steve discussion if not all in favor say aye aye opposed motion passes agenda item number 19 um the Merit Center outfall project. Again, final change order, acknowledgement of the final pay application. So move. Second. second. Motion by Craig, seconded by Steve. Discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. I was ready uh, to talk about these. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. Yes. <laughs> Agenda item number 20 then would be the Commission Board uh, reports. I'll start on the um, Southwest Regional Development Commission did have their annual meeting this past Thursday. Uh, it was held at the um, at the brewery in Laverne, Minnesota, very well attended. However, uh, the public was not invited. It was uh, only the board and the full commission because um, continuing to be concerned about public gatherings that um, they didn't, it was limited to only the only the full commission, but still a big group. The um, Fire Relief Association Board of Trustees uh, uh, had their quarterly meeting this morning. Um, several things, they received the audit report, which was uh, presented by Hoffman and Bropes, and it was a, a clean and good audit report. Um, secondly, the performance of the fund, which was pre presented by um, the fund manager, which is Bremer, um, um, showed good performance on the fund year um, year to date calendar year the total fund is six point one percent and then this is also the time of year that the the state statute mandated schedules that take into account the revenue from the funds uh, performance the expenditures and any payouts or other expenditures as well as the state aid that comes from uh, state insurance um, surcharges, and then the remaining amount then would be the city contribution. So for 2022, there's no contribution that is required <coughs> from the city, similar to our current year. 
So that was the Fire Relief Association. Um, with that, which, uh, which end do we start with? Uh, Craig. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Merit Center uh, will be meeting on Thursday, but I was uh, lucky enough to get the uh, director, the coordinator's report. And so uh, for the uh, May and June, uh, some of the customized training that was provided by Minnesota West there included steam and hot water boiler training, EVOC, the emergency vehicle operations, motorcycle safety, moped course, which we're you know seeing a lot more mopeds, so I'm glad to see that they're running a course, a safety course out there, commercial vehicle inspections, and CDL training. Uh, Redwood Falls Police Department utilized our use of force simulator for their firearms training uh, in May. Avera has been holding their monthly leadership meetings there, and they've booked to do so for the remainder through 2022. And that's about 40 to 55 people that attend each of those meetings. And then LG Seeds returned there for their quarterly employee meeting on June 11th, and that's 48 people. So the facility's getting used very well by you know both public safety, law enforcement, emergency services, and then also by our businesses. Uh, some of the updates, um, they're gonna do updates to the old CAT, you know, chemical assessment team office spaces, some changes to classroom C, uh, some security cameras installation, and then the part of the track expansion, we still need to complete the water source to do the skill pad. You know, that's, that's one thing left on the punch list there. Um, and then uh, just kind of the usage, uh, classrooms and or the driving track was used 41 out of 61 days. So that's pretty good. Um, the May June combination numbers of people attending is four or five hundred and seventy three. So uh, good traffic, good use out there, um, and I, I've yet to hear negative input from anybody that's been out there. Everything I hear has always been positive. And again, I want to really thank Jasmine for all the work she did. We're I think we're pretty much out of COVID at the merit now, so things are really rolling and. She's done an excellent job, so thank you for that. And Mr. Mayor, that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Craig. Steve? Mine have not met, Mr. Mayor. Don? Uh, Lighting Commission meets tomorrow night. Public housing postponed their meeting from yesterday to, I think, next Tuesday, I think. John? Uh, mine also have not met uh, since our last meeting. Uh, EDA is next week. Uh, MMU meets uh, next Tuesday night, and uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, meets tomorrow. Russ? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. But the Library Board met last night. Uh, they continue to see a steady increase in the branches in Cottonwood and Ballotton and, and people that they have never seen before, and, and what they're saying by a steady increase. I mean, uh, an increase of, of 13 people a day makes a st pretty good increase for them. They also continue to see a daily increase in Marshall, especially on Saturday, because they opened up on Saturday now. Michelle will be here, uh, I believe, on August 10th to present to the full council the budget request for 2022. Uh, just a, a short brief on Plum Creek Library System. As you, uh, Michelle has been helping them out, uh, you know, very limited basis for the past year, but they have now, uh, they were advertising for a director. They have seven candidates that applied, believe it or not. Uh, last time I think they had only two or three, but uh, they have five very uh, qualified candidates and they will interview those five via Zoom and then uh, invite three in to do a face-to-face. -face. So they hope to have uh, um, a director in place pretty soon. And Michelle will be done with her interim helping out at the end of the year. So uh, hopefully that'll proceed. So that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you, Russ. Uh, Jim. Um, my name is Matt. Okay. We'll move then to council member individual items. Jim, I'm going to start on your end. Well, I'll just say I'm glad to be in City Hall. You know, and I, I want to thank my fellow committee members. We are still meeting. There's some stuff to wrap up, but it is nice to be sitting here after all the work that was done and all the discussions that we've had. And so it's just it's a pleasure to be in here. Well, I think as the council really needs to thank the uh, council committee, which is all to my right for all the time that you put in and work with staff on this, so thank you. And especially your city administrator for yes. all the work she's put in. So. And a whole bunch of other staff members around here, Kyle and Alex, uh, it's, a, it's a nice long list. It is a long list. The other thing I want to comment on is, is um, I do like looking out the windows, even though we keep putting Deb in the dark. No, the lights <laughs> go on. Um, <laughs> I, a couple little minor adjustments. So. Yeah. 
I did notice a couple scooters go by. I see the scooters are in town and, and they seem to be getting used. Thanks, Deb, for making our lights work. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think the scooters are, I just want to comment that I've seen the scooters around and, and I, like I said, I don't know who's talking and I kind of zoned off into them, zoomed by our meetings, out, our windows out here. <laughs> so, and that's a note to all you guys who talk a lot. I have windows to look out. <laughs> So they do that's have all blinds. I have. <laughs> what? They do have blinds. We can pull the blinds. I'll just open them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Russ? Uh, the only thing I have is that a few weeks ago I had called Jason about our fourth street and first street projects about the weeds growing on, on the boulevard. And technically, I know it's supposed to be the homeowner's responsibility, but evidently we had, must have had somebody go out and mow them over the weekend because I know there was a few spots where the weeds were probably getting to be at probably three feet tall, two to three feet tall. And so J thank you, Jason, for getting that taken care of. Otherwise, uh, I will just echo what Councilman Lazinski and uh, Councilman DeKramer said about City Hall. It's nice to be here. It's even though we sit in chairs that are a little bit low, but <laughs> we'll get there eventually. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. John? Yeah, and just uh, we got a few bugs to take care of yet in the building, but it's, other than that, it's come along very well. And uh, I do like the results and glad we're here downtown. Um, just uh, in regards to the uh, the scooters that were brought up, uh, that was one thing I noticed that uh, uh, as we were sitting here, it's nice to have them in town. I think they're getting uh, quite a bit of use. Uh, I think we may need to, at least from ourselves or for other ones, uh, review, okay, what's the rules to follow? I see some on the sidewalk, some on the street. Um, Kind of a reminder that if you're using a scooter, uh, you still need to stop at a stop sign and things like that. So, um, uh, you know, just maybe, and I'm not sure where that comes in at, but a re, uh, review of the rules of the road, uh, probably good for the scooters as well. So, yeah, look to Chief Marshall for that. Don't yeah, look okay. Here. <laughs> well, <laughs> and that, that may be a nice uh, public education, you know, probably led by public safety, but. Uh, you bring up a, a point, this is new, and, um, you know, there are reminders that are needed. Yes. And, Mr. Mayor, just uh, Lauren Dites, she has already left, but prior to the meeting, she said she couldn't believe the number of hours, and I believe it was in excess of 3,000 hours, yeah, or 5,000 hours or whatever it was. And, and uh, there have been some complaints. She, has, she have, has received some complaints, so we will be having to address those as further down the road. So. Yeah. Anything else, Ted? No, that's that. Craig? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, and I just want to echo the, first of all, the positivity of City Hall. Awesome job for everybody that worked on it. I know it's a it's a large amount of people and, and for the council committee to represent us and, and, and our staff, a nice job. It's it's really awesome. On the scooter thing, I, um, I know the 4th of July at Independence Park, there was concern because there were uh, some family members of mine that came out just about got run over by, you know, two kids on the scooter. And it was a mixed blessing because they love seeing the, the activity. But again, it's a learning curve and, and we have to be patient and we just have to work through it. But uh, I think it's a very positive thing for the community. I'm really glad to see that. And then on the other hand, uh, or another item, the last item that I have is um, we had a number of us got some local citizen concerns about some conditions in the alley with garbage containers and some other things. And I want to thank city staff and administration for uh, how hard they worked at that and, and got that resolved. And that's a property <coughs> owner that's in kind of one of those tough, tough transition neighborhoods where there's some rentals there and, and there's been a little bit, I think, of mobility or, or change of occupants there. And the landlords had a little trouble maybe keeping up with it, uh, with kind of educating the new residents. So... I really appreciate the efforts that staff make to resolve those on behalf of the, the community, and, and I thank them for that. So that's all I have. Craig, or um, not Craig, Steve. We look a lot alike. We do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you, yeah. I, I lucky, also, <laughs> yeah. I also um, am really impressed with this facility. I think it's great. We'll get the bugs worked out eventually. Um, my heart goes out to the Broadmoor Valley people. Oh, that boy. just breaks my heart. And I have gone through there. I've gone through there on my duly city licensed four wheeler. And literally it's, it's, I have to have that four wheeler because when I hit those potholes, I bottom out. It's, and that's with a, that's with a Polaris General and a Honda Pioneer. That it's just horrible. And you see the, 
dilapidated buildings. We've got to do something. We've got to start enforcing our city ordinances that say get rid of those because those are fire hazards. Kids are going to play in there just because kids go into places like that because they're haunted, they're fun, they're whatever. They're going to get hurt. They're going to lacerate themselves and they're going to get hurt more and worrisome is they're going to get killed. And then you start having vermin in there and I mean, it's just, it's just horrible. Uh, you know, I don't know if you annex it. I don't know if you, how we work it. The one thing that I want city to, administration to start thinking about city staff, we just went to a, um, baseball tournament last weekend in Worthington, and they have a beautiful city park with camping. I've never been there before. It was awesome. It was just beautiful. Yep. They've got it right on the bike path. There's no reason we can't utilize and leverage Camden in our bike path with all the sporting events, with the Merritt Center, with the, with the Red Baron Arena. Think about bringing people to southwest Minnesota. Having a camp, campground would be really a good idea. So, just an idea. Thanks, Steve. Done. Well, I wasn't going to say anything tonight, but since everybody else is bringing up different things, I've, <laughs> me and the mayor, or I have advocated for camping in the city of Marshall Public Limits since I, the 90s when I was first on the council. Yeah, it's a, it's a sorely needed attraction. It really I is. I think that we should be uh, checking out, again, the Broadmoor Valley thing. I couldn't agree more with you, uh, Doc. Um, I, you know, and I don't know where we go. Hopefully, uh, run this guy out of town is what I'd like to do. But uh, I think maybe um, the powers that be here, Sharon and may uh, Mayor, uh, maybe we need to start talking with uh, Mr. Swidzinski and Mr. Doms and anybody that has an ear that we can talk to about maybe streamlining the process, strengthening the city's hand in dealing with these types of issues. There, there is no reason why that guy should still be allowed to practice his business in our city the way he treats his residents out there. Mr. Mr. Mayor, is this is it a can we have a discussion right now on this? I mean, can we a little open dialogue, or is it we probably better wait till closed session, right? I, I think that would be appropriate. Okay, right. Yeah, because I yes. have some pretty strong feelings too, but I think right. we maybe better wait. Right. But I'm going to close with that. And Thank you, Doc. Move on. Thank you. Okay. Um, for my part, I'll, I'll again take us back to the discussion about the uh, uh, our first meeting here in in. The renovated city hall, as everyone knows, there Thursday of this week. There's public open houses uh, that will and tours for the public. There'll be a um, opening ceremony, ribbon cutting that will be at four o'clock. The a uh, uh, lot of people will be recognized that were um, played a big part in this project. That includes the city hall committee, but it also includes the staff that work very hard in this, and as well as the uh, the general contractor, the architect, as well as many, many subcontractors. So, you know, hopefully everybody will be able to uh, to be part of that. Second thing I would say, and, you know, this meeting really coincides with, um, um, I'll say it, Steve, like opening up. And, you know, while we probably still have concerns about public health, we're uh, in a lot different place than we were a year ago at this time. Yeah. And one of those indicators is uh, sales tax revenue. So, from and so I have some data here that was provided by our finance department. So, the um, so from April 2020 to April 2021, our food and beverage um, sales tax receipts in the city of Marshall that April to April is up 82 percent year to date, um, January through April of 2020, as compared to January through April of 2021, up 18.7%. Lodging, April to April, up 311%. Uh, year to date, 18.7%. And then the sales and use tax, and we recall the sales and use tax, actually in 2020 was up, Sharon help me with that number, about two and a half to three percent, as compared to 2019. So our sales and use tax, and this is the half cent sales tax, April to April is up 35%. And um, 
that's year to date. Year to date is up 35%, April to April, 47.8%. So I think that says two things. One is, you know, the public is back. The public is using uh, um, our local retailers on purchasing. Um, restaurants are they're frequenting the hospitality industry and we have visitors back in the community so all of those things i you know co coincide with coming together with city hall that marshall's back open for business so with that i'll move on then to staff reports sharon uh we make a great team the council and the staff and i think the city hall project is just a really good credit to that. The staff have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed uh, their office space and much more productivity and uh, efficiency. We're using the meeting spaces, all the technology. And um, I know that we spent a lot of public money for this, and um, but we did not put lipstick on a pig. This was a done right the first time, structural changes, uh, a lot of enhancements that will last 50 years plus. And um, yeah, it's just it's just a great facility. And and we're, we're on behalf of staff, we're very grateful. Um, so I just want to comment on that briefly. A uh, few other things. Um, I believe Don mentioned there's a planning commission meeting tomorrow night. The city has had a request for tax increment financing uh, from a developer to um, construct some additional apartments. Uh, we recently w received a draft housing study. The draft housing study indicated a need. And let me just dive in a little bit deeper on this in case you get some comments back about tax increment financing. Uh, housing study indicated not only that um, is there a need for additional housing in the city of Marshall, but looking forward, uh, and I can't remember the time span, I think it might be the next 20 years or 10, 50% of all housing needs in, in the area is going to be needed by the city of Marshall. So there's a bulk of, of what we need right here in the city of Marshall, and we have to. We have to look to the future and what we have. And um, population, let's talk about that a little bit as well. I believe, and Kyle can correct me, that the population uh, numbers from census, I don't think it's going to be until next year. I think it got delayed until March or May of 2022. Um, the last I had heard was the September deadline, but if that had changed to okay. March, then... So we're really relying right now on estimates from state demographer. Here's the state demographer's estimates on population. And who is going to see an increase from 2010? The city of Cottonwood, Grandview Township, which is essentially Klein Edition, the city of Land, and the city of Marshall. All other townships and communities in the city, in the Lyon County, will see a decrease. If you base this on the state demographer, Lyon County as a whole will see, see a decrease. The city of Marshall. Based on the state demographer, census could be different. Uh, is the only is one of the few communities that will see an increase. So, um, I think this is really important in terms of economic development and why we need to work together and not nitpick one economic development proposal over another, not one community over another. We really have to be to be um, on the same page. Finally, I'll say and we'll provide this to the Planning Commission, even though their role is to determine does it meet the comprehensive plan, not so much do they like the, the actual project. Um, I, I think it's important um, to note that there's a lot of requirements for TIF, and the, the state legislature has a whole listing of them. So I will say that for some developers, within the city of Marshall or regionally or locally, this may not be for them. In fact, if I had some local developers uh, meeting with me, I may recommend to them that they not pursue TIF because of the requirements of TIF. 
Uh, you have to have patience, the tenacity to go through some of these requirements. And for some people, and I'm one of them, even though I work for government, I don't like regulation from time to time, it would drive me crazy. And I think for some of the local developers, because I know them, it just isn't going to work for them. It would drive them crazy on the requirements they got to meet. So I want to mention that on TIF. We'll talk more about that following Planning Commission, and, and eventually it's going to come here. I'm, uh, Dr. Meister brought up uh, campgrounds. We're still doing some uh, informal work on the community survey, and one of the goals is how do we pay for aquatic center, but also what capacity do we have as a community look into the future in terms of park and recreation. One of the slides we presented at a work session on financing was, here's some things the community needs. And I know Dr. Meister has been really great about other communities, what his family has enjoyed, not only your observation of a campground, um, but some other sports entertainment venues in other communities. There, there's definitely a need, and we wanna ask these questions in the community survey. A campground was on that list as well. Um, and you know we've, we wanna narrow it down a little bit and get some feedback on that, so we'll continue to do that. But I think they're really important questions, and I think it's important that uh, the sales tax was brought up as, as well. We uh, staff at this point really think that's the way forward to pay for some of these things, extending the sales tax. Um, we're falling behind a little bit in comparable cities in terms of park and recreation. New Ulm, Wilmer, Worthington, Hutchinson, um, Detroit Lakes, I, right? I could go on. There's so many cities to list. We have one. We just got to keep it going. And it seems, it seems a really good path forward. I can't have the headline say we're going to increase taxes because we're not, we're keeping it the same. That's our proposal. But uh, maybe we, we do some additional public relations on that. Two other really quick things. Annette Storm and her staff have done doing a lot of work on budgeting. They got some initial, they were due, I believe, this week or late last week. She's got to do some analysis. We've done a lot of discussions about CIP, liquor store revenue, um, aquatic center, and uh, we'll kind of work through that. She is also, Emma, as a, <coughs> she's also on task for the American Rescue Plan funds. We still do not have those. Uh, we're we're waiting for the state, and uh, we do want to replenish some lost revenue in in food, beverage, and lodging from last year. It's an allowable expense. We're going to try to do that. It's not a lot of money. Um, it's 1.5. I mean, it's a lot of money if you look federally across the nation. I don't want to minimize that, but for us, you know, we could, we will put good use to it. Doesn't go very far. So I want to mention that. And then uh, finally, I think since I've gotten here, I've taken on an intern during the summer. I usually get approached and um, I did that again this summer. Um, it's been very busy, but I want to give an opportunity uh, for the intern that uh, we have this summer to introduce herself and uh, talk a little bit about her background and how great it is to work with the city administrator. Who's the marketer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 We, and and, and we do have a time limit here. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, don't worry. So I'm Molly Krogh. I am Sharon's marketing intern, and I promise it's not as bad as what you're thinking. <laughs> I actually have had a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. So I'm going to school at the University of South Alabama in Mobile. Uh, so a two-day drive that's lots of fun, but I'm studying communications and marketing. So this has been a great opportunity. Sharon has given me a lot of experience, so that's really fun. I just did my freshman year, so I'm still like new to it and all that, but it's been a really good experience, so yeah. So do they ask you, are you from Wisconsin, or do they figure Minnesota? They figure Minnesota, especially <laughs> after I say the O. I get a lot of repeats, Minnesota, Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> Well, well, we're glad you're here. So yes, yeah, thank you. It's go. good to be here. Yeah, and that's Ready? all I had, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Jason. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, give a quick update on the construction projects for you. Um, the municipal state aid mill and overlay project. You've probably noticed that uh, we're doing more than ped ramps now. The mill has gotten out, and uh, we've milled Lion Street, uh, 
part of the Bruce Street that's going to get done anyway from Lyon to College Drive. Uh, Country Club Drive and Jewett Street have all been milled. They should be done as of tonight. Uh, so that's exciting. We'll see some pavement this week, hopefully, on Country Club Drive with the new surface. Uh, the rest of it will be next week. Uh, North First Street is looking more and more done. They should have most of it covered with gravel now. We're doing sidewalk work. All the utilities are done with exception to a water main tie-in on Redwood and College. So we're in a great spot there. Uh, James and Camden's just on hold for concrete. It could be on hold for another couple weeks. So we'll see how that goes. We met with the Corps of Engineers and their contractor last week to have a pre-construction meeting on the uh, Betterments project or the uh, levy repair project. Uh, that went well. I'm having technical difficulties and I can't get into the server to find out and remind myself when they were going to start, but it's not in the near term. They're going to start in a little while yet. It's probably over a month out, but they have a deadline of this fall to hit. I believe it's November 30th and there'll be no problems doing that. So that'll be exciting and we've got every reason to believe that this contractor will do a nice job. Um, other than that, adjust your water softeners and that's all I've got. Thank you, Jason. Dennis? Thank you, Mayor. Kind of following up on the discussion of positive things happening, we're, we're still waiting to close on this um, best topsoil sale in border states. And the reason that's kind of delayed is there's so much activity in the housing market, we can't get title work done through the abstracting offices. All the documents are prepared, they're all ready to go, but we're just waiting for the final title commitments to verify, yes, Housing and Redevelopment Authority does own the property and has the authority to sell it. So title work I mean, used to take, you could get it in a week or so, and now it's about two to three to four weeks out into the future. And so we're just waiting for that final title work to be done for both buyers. And then we did receive notification, verification that unique opportunities, all of their financing is in place. To this. So they'll be starting phase three in the very near future to finish up that development along Legion Field Road. Okay. So, Thank you, Dennis. We'll move then to the remaining items. Um, the administrative brief are, are there for your review, Russ? Mr. Mayor, thank you. Just a couple of questions. And Jason, maybe you can just answer this. On the street department, it said uh, street and parking lot painting as paint becomes available. Paint has been hard to get due to COVID. And the next item is getting quotes for on street bike lane and street painting. I mean, it's, if it's that's hard to get, should we maybe look at postponing, get the paint and maybe do it next spring instead? Of, I mean, we're getting to the end of the season here. I mean, just a thought. I mean, sure. Those are two, I'll call it two separate items. So the street department staff is having a hard time acquiring the paint that they like to do their portion and their work. They've had to make some substitutions and they're kind of getting by. The um, quotes are for an outside contractor who does the long lines for us. And uh, we've got no indications from those contractors that they don't have materials. So we, we okay. have every reason to believe that they'll be able to come in and do the work for us. We imagine that it'll align with our mill and overlay project in the state aid routes because we've got a lot of that striping built into that project. So we'll have a contractor here already. We imagine they'll just piggyback and do the rest of the work. MnDOT's also got another contractor doing their work, so we should get good numbers. Okay, thank you. And then I have one other question. Sorry, John. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Maybe um, Officer or Director of Public Safety, Jim Marshall. Can I, I had a couple of uh, downtown businesses. I was down visiting with a couple of them last week, and I had some juveniles break a gas line on top of one of the buildings downtown, and just a natural gas line. It could have been a severe, severe situation. With a, and this was on the roof. They were on the roof of the buildings and they broke a gas line and unfortunately they're juveniles. I think there was one adult, if I correct, but but uh, the others are juveniles, so I don't think there's going to be any prosecution whatsoever. But um, it's just it's something that could have been avoided. And, and uh, I know during construction of City Hall, you know, we had a roof opening too that, you know, a, a few of us brought up all the times that we should make sure that thing is latched and it is now. But, why these kids are getting on top of buildings and doing the damage there is beyond me. But that could have been a serious situation because I'm not sure if there's firewalls on any part of that side of the street and then something, a spark could have lit half of Main Street on fire, I would think. So that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. And John? Uh, just a question back to Jason. Uh, unfortunately, we did not get our uh, Minnesota DNR funding for Independence Park. Uh, is there other possibilities that you see coming up out of there or this uh, maybe opening up next year again or 
Any so thoughts on that? I may um, have a group conversation with Sharon and Annette on this, but we were, we've been doing some talking about that project. And on the engineering side, you know, we're prepared to pivot with the design. Uh, do you want to start with that, Sharon, or do you want me to talk uh, more on about On Independence it? Park? Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for bringing that up. We did not receive the DNR grant of 250000 um, we were sorely disappointed in the Department of Natural Resources. Um, they did not give us what we believe to be good reasons, but uh, so be it. They're the decision maker. And um, we are looking at alternative funding sources. To the, it was only 250, 250000 Again, not minimizing it because it helps spurred the discussion and thought process on it. Um, and... You know, one of the areas that we're considering, and Annette didn't want to give the green light on this. She wants to do a little more analysis, but it's very possible we would make up for that denial by liquor store revenue funds from 2020, which the community had a large role in that uh, revenue enhancement. And I think it might be a really good use for those additional funds that we generated. And uh, that's kind of what we're looking at on some of the additional design features. I mean, I, this is just administration talking and finance. Um, we're kind of recommending maybe not going forward with that. Um, and there's a variety of reasons why. We're not the decision makers. Obviously, the council could say, nope, we really want to see it. But um, just to kind of save some money and the proximity of it, it's, it's not the most visible location within the city, um, even though we know Independence Park is used quite a bit. But so that's where we're at with it. Once we get some more, a um, little more um, validation on that funding source, we can come back. Okay. Any other input on the administrative brief? If not, you also have the information items, including the building permits, which then leads us to agenda item. Uh, number 27, the uh, question will to go into um, executive closed session purpose would be to discuss city storage needs. Is there a motion to go into closed session at this time? So moved. Second. Motion by Jim, seconded by Craig. Discussion? If not, all in favor of going into closed session, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. We'll pause for a a few minutes uh, to go into closed session. Mm -hmm.